happy Wednesday, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to another Planetarium live stream. My name is Patrick Hess. I'm the Planetarium Specialist at Union Station, and I'm really excited to have you here joining us today for yet another uh, live stream. Today's live stream is uh, our Wednesday deep dive live stream. This will be yet another uh, one in our series of deep dives into different topics of uh, astronomy, and today's is going to be kind of fun because we're diving into science fiction and the physics and astronomy of some fictional worlds you all may be familiar with. Uh, if you're uh, joining us for the first time, then welcome. So glad you're joining us. Just uh, to let you know about our schedule, we stream every Monday and Wednesday at 6 p.m. Mondays are our What's Up stream for the week, where I give you a tour of our evening sky, we're teaching you about different stars and constellations you can see during this time of year. Uh, and then Wednesday is our deep dive stream day, where we dive into a topic uh, all uh, about astronomy. We've covered a lot of topics in the past, um, from taking a tour of our solar system, learning about stellar evolution, uh, a best of the Messier catalog, where we looked at different deep space objects. Uh, we learned about probes and rovers. We set up a telescope in my living room, uh, and we talked about the Voyager Golden Record, the messages that we've sent out into space. So a lot of really fun topics we've covered already. Just a reminder that if you missed any of our previous streams or want to rewatch, uh, then uh, check out uh, all the streams are recorded and available for your perusal uh, on our Facebook pages. So be sure to check that out. Uh, we have almost hit 100,000 views. So uh, thank you all so much for your support. Uh, and thanks for liking and subscribing to the Planetarium Facebook page. If you haven't yet, uh, be sure to subscribe to the Arvind Gottlieb Planetarium. Thanks for telling your friends about us. And thanks to everyone for supporting Union Station, uh, to our Union Station members and to anybody else who supported us uh, during the past couple months. Um, but without further ado, let's dive in to our stream today. Um, and actually, I wanted to start first by answering a question that we had uh, from Monday's stream that we didn't get a chance to answer. And this question came from Tammy. And Tammy asked, uh, with the conjunction coming up on December 21st for the first time in a long time, is it a coincidence or does this usually happen around the winter solstice? This is what Tammy asks. Um, now, I wanted to talk a, about this uh, in a, a couple different ways. First of all, uh, for those of you who don't know about this, uh, on December 21st, Jupiter and Saturn are going to be right next to each other, the closest that they ever appear in the night sky. We call this the Great Conjunction. Uh, and they will be right next to each other. And uh, if you look at them through a pair of binoculars or a telescope, you'll see them right next to each other. Um, now, these planets obviously aren't close to one another, but what, ha what happens and the reason they appear close is because their orbits have lined up. Now, I wanted to uh, uh, make an edit or a retraction, I suppose, uh, because I've been saying uh, this only happens every 30 or so years. I actually got that slightly wrong. This happens about every 20 years. Um, but uh, the question still stands, uh, is this a coincidence that this is happening around the winter solstice, or in this case, right on the winter solstice? Uh, and the answer is yes, that is actually a coincidence. Now, uh, you might think that this, this could uh, be connected, and uh, you wouldn't be too far off thinking that because uh, the solstices uh, have to do with uh, the Earth's uh, position in its orbit around the sun, and conjunctions have to do with other planets' positions in their orbits around the sun. Uh, but this is just a coincidence. Um, Jupiter orbits the sun once every 12 years, and Saturn orbits the sun once every uh, 30 years. And so this is just sort of a harmonic lineup when uh, every once in a while they'll cross paths, uh, and it'll be about once every 20 years. The last time this happened was on May 31st, the year 2000. Uh, and the next time will be uh, on November 5th of 2040. So uh, it is just a coincidence, um, and I'm looking back uh, at least over the past... 200 years, uh, these haven't lined up. Well, actually, 1821, the Great Conjunction took place on December 23rd, so kind of close. Um, but again, that is just a coincidence that those dates are lined up. But that is a very good question, Tammy. Thanks so much for asking that. And remember, if you have any questions, please comment in uh, the comment section of all the uh, streams, wherever you're watching, and we'll try to answer them today. Uh, and uh, I will try to do a better job of checking them and make sure, making sure I don't miss any as well. But uh, throw in your questions in the comment section or just comment if you want to say hi. Uh, oh, and I, actually, I just noticed another question came in from Jennifer, who asks, uh, is there a season that's best for stargazing? Uh, and there is, uh, and the answer is, uh, whatever season has a night that has the clear sky, <laughs> because oftentimes stargazing is, uh, is hampered by weather more than anything else, uh, and if it's a cloudy day, then it doesn't matter what season it is, it's going to be hard for stargazing. But to really answer your question, um, 
I love stargazing in the summertime because here in the Northern Hemisphere, it's, well, a lot warmer. Uh, and you can see uh, the galactic center, the center of the Milky Way, where it's very dense and full of a lot of stars. Um, now, unfortunately, in the summertime, uh, especially when it's very warm, there's a lot of atmospheric distortion. So a lot of heat radiating from the ground uh, will cause a lot of distortion and making, make it really hard to resolve objects like planets and nebulas. Um, so in that case, winter is a better time for stargazing because the atmospheric conditions may be a little better. Uh, other than that, though, it really just depends on what you, what you want to look at. Um, winter is great for stargazing. If you want to look at Orion, one of the brightest constellations, which has a lot of beautiful nebulas inside of it, it'll be in the early evening sky. But then again, if you want to see Orion, you'd have to just wake up early in the summertime, and you'll see it then as well. So um, really, any time is good for stargazing. Winter for the atmospheric conditions, I would say. Uh, but thanks for asking that great question, Jennifer. Um, all right, so uh, we got a lot of stuff to cover, and I always bite up more than I can chew, uh, and uh, I've got a lot of notes uh, because today's topic is all about the fantastical universes of fiction. So I picked a couple uh, notable fictional universes, uh, both in science fiction and fantasy, uh, to talk a little bit about some science and astronomy relating to them. Um, and so hopefully we'll talk about one of your favorite universes, and if not, uh, then we may have time to check out some more later on. But I wanted to start with uh, a universe some of you may be familiar with, but some of you may not. And I'm going to start with this just because I want to give it a shout out. And um, and if you don't know about this, I would highly encourage you to check it out. Uh, and I'm going to start by talking about uh, the universe that Terry Pratchett uh, created in his Discworld novels. Uh, and these are really fun books. Uh, they are mostly fantasy, uh, set in a magical setting, um, but they're very, very funny. Uh, the writing reminds me of uh, Douglas Adams and The Hitchhiker's Guide. So if you like The Hitchhiker's Guide, I would definitely recommend checking out the Discworld novels. But um, most of the action in the Discworld novels takes place on the Discworld, which is a flat earth on the back of four elephants riding on the back of a giant turtle flying through space. This turtle's name is Atuin. Uh, and he is very large, as you can see. Um, now, this universe involves magic, of course, um, uh, but uh, there are some little scientific uh, tidbits we can pull from this, and I wanted to use this opportunity to talk a little bit about something I haven't talked about during streams before, and that is the Flat Earth. So, as you can see, uh, in this universe, uh, the Discworld is a Flat Earth. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about the flat Earth. I'm not going to dive into why we know the Earth is not flat. And if you are curious about that, um, then maybe that could be a topic for another stream. Uh, let me know in the comments. Um, but I wanted to just assume that what if the Earth was flat or what if there was such a thing as a flat Earth? What uh, would that do to physics? Um, and it'd be pretty strange. Uh, assuming gravity behaves uh, in the same way it does in our current universe, uh, then uh, things would be uh, pretty weird on this flat earth. And I just wanted to show you, this is a really great, great video clip that um, is on a really uh, great science YouTube channel called Vsauce. Um, but this is just a little clip I've cut out. And it's just showing us that um, gravity is going to behave the same way in the universe uh, in, if, our, if there was a flat earth in our universe. Most of the mass is going to be centered on the center of the disk. But a funny thing would happen if you started walking towards the edge of the disk. Because the way gravity works in this physics uh, system that we live in, this universe we live in, is that um, things would start kind of tilting over. And as you can see, this sort of character walking towards the edge of the Earth would actually experience this downward force, the gravity pulling him down, kind of having any angle. And you can see these buildings. This is how you'd have to build a building to kind of maintain uh, or to, to have a sort of a flat surface to walk on. Um, and so as you can see, now, continuing towards the edge of this flat Earth, it gets steeper and steeper as gravity is pulling you towards the center of mass of this uh, this disk planet. Uh, and then a uh, funny thing happens when you get all the way to the edge of the disk. Um, as you can see, it gets so steep, but eventually uh, you would actually make it all the way to the edge. And assuming this was a thick, uh, this disk had thickness, you would be able to stand on the edge of the Earth, uh, sort of perpendicular to the rest of the planet. So uh, if a flat Earth actually did exist, the danger would not be in falling off the edge. It would actually really be in tripping and rolling all the way back down to the center. Um, but I just thought that was a really cool uh, sort of demonstration of how the flat Earth would work uh, in this uh, particular universe system. Uh, now, there are a couple other little details about uh, the flat Earth. Now, if there was such a thing as a flat Earth, how would the sun work? Well, the sun would have to be a ball sort of floating above the Earth kind of moving in a circle. Um, and uh, now, in, in the Discworld novels, they describe the sun as being one mile across. 
um, which is kind of crazy and uh, just crazy enough that I've decided to uh, actually try to simulate this. So this software we've used before, this is called Universe Sandbox and it gives us a little uh, physics sandbox we can experiment with gravity, but it also has uh, um, uh, properties of stars and you can adjust parameters of stars to change them. So um, I'm gonna load up a new simulation, which will just be empty here. I'm just gonna pause time and I'm gonna add the sun to our simulation here. We're just gonna plop it right there in the middle. There is the sun. Now if I right click on the sun, I can actually edit the sun. Um, and now the sun is pretty big. Uh, as we can see here, it's about 700 kilometers across, or 700,000 kilometers across, um, which that's the radius rather. Um, now uh, if we wanted, uh, so let's, let's try to make our star as big as it would be in a flat earth. Um, so that would be, uh, so one mile across is about how they described it, the sun in the Discworld novels. Um, and uh, so we're gonna go twice as much as that since, or we're gonna, sorry, we're gonna go half of that because it's, uh, we're talking about the radius, which is half the diameter. Uh, and in kilometers, that would be 0.8 kilometers. And if I do that, hmm, okay. Sun seemed to have disappeared. And if I zoom in, uh-oh, I turned the sun into a black hole. <laughs> Now what I did is uh, I changed the radius of the sun. I uh, actually made it even bigger. Um, I'm gonna lock that in place. I changed the radius of the sun uh, to a very, very small size without changing its mass. And as we learned in some previous tour, uh, previous streams, uh, especially our stream about stellar evolution, there's this thing called a Schwarzschild radius. Basically there is a radius where if a mass, a massive object gets to a small enough point the subatomic bonds or forces that keep neutrons apart will break down and that object will turn into a black hole. Everything in our universe will actually, could, could actually turn into a black hole if you compress it small enough. And our sun has a short child radius of about two miles. So we can't make the sun any smaller than a two mile radius or else it'll turn into a black hole. In fact, uh, that black hole just evaporated. <laughs> it was so tiny. Um, so. If we wanted to make a sun this small, we'd actually have to change the mass. So I would have to actually edit the sun's mass. Um, and now remember, its Schwarzschild, Schwarzschild radius uh, is about two miles, which uh, is um, about uh, three kilometers, 3.2 kilometers across. Um, so, uh, and we want it to be about one point, so we want it to be about one mile across. Um, so we want it to have a half mile radius. So we probably want it, uh, so let's just try, I'm just doing very basic math in my head. So I just made the sun uh, one quarter as massive, and then I'm going to change the radius uh, to 0.8, and hopefully, ah, great, it stays being a sun, even though it is just 800 meters across. <laughs> um, now this is uh, based on, uh, again, what we know about the physics of stars. Um, now, uh, now the thing though is that, so we've got this star that's that size, but if we assume that on the disk world, the sun is the same size as it appears in the sky, uh, then it would need to be a lot closer to us if it's that small. So the sun is really big, but it appears about the same size. We call that the angular diameter. It appears about the same angular diameter as the moon. We know the moon is much smaller though. And the reason it's about the same angular diameter as the sun is because it's much closer. So imagine an object one a mile across. How close would it have to be uh, to appear the same size as the sun? And the answer is, is that it would have to orbit, uh, it would have to be above the ground about 1.8 miles. That's how close it would have to be. Now, as you can imagine, with changes in elevation, that might cause problems. If there was a star 1.8 miles above the ground, uh, imagine it going through a mountain range. So that universe could probably could not really exist. Um, now, I also did some calculations. Uh, so the problem also is that this star still has a mass 262 times the mass of Jupiter. So there is no way that this sun could orbit the Earth. Uh, and the Earth, or the disk world, uh, and Terry Pratchett's disk world is, uh, novels is about the same size as the Earth, about the same radius. I think it's slightly wider actually, but um, its mass is gonna be similar. Uh, and if you're wondering how small, so, it, so the, to get a star to orbit that small object, the star would have to be smaller than that object for sure. But unfortunately, um, this could never happen because the smallest a star could be before it is no longer able to ignite stellar fusion is 79 Jupiters. Um, so if I change this to 80 Jupiters, it's gonna adjust the radius, but that's okay. Um, we can see that it is still a star, but if I 
make this smaller. In fact, I can drag the slider. Oop. If I make it smaller than 79 Jupiters, it will stop igniting stellar fusion, and our simulation here will actually change it from a star to uh, a brown dwarf or a, a sub star or a super Jupiter, a lot of different names for them. Um, but it's kind of cool that we can actually just drag the slider and change the mass. Nope, I go above 78 Jupiters and it turns into a star again. Um, so that's a little bit about a little bit of information about a flat Earth. Again, I'm not going to uh, disprove the flat Earth theory, although actually I did want to bring up something because the Earth doesn't appear flat to us, but it could if we were traveling close to the speed of light. So there's something kind of weird about Einstein's uh, theories of relativity, in particular his special relativity, and I'm not going to dive too deep into those physics, but basically if you start moving at relativistic speeds, that means you're moving close to the speed of light, then objects around you will undergo contraction. This is called Lorentz contraction, and basically things will become shorter the faster you travel. Um, and there's actually a really cool little uh, demonstration or a little uh, graphic I can show you. Um, here we go. Uh, the right button. All right. This is on a great website I found called the Physics Classroom. And this is showing us that uh, so um, if you were on the ground and you saw a spaceship flying by you, if it was traveling 10% the speed of light, uh, then it would seem pretty much like a normal spaceship. But as it starts moving closer and closer to the speed of light, it'll actually appear to contract. And moving fast enough to about 99.99% speed of light, it will appear completely flat. So if you can imagine uh, you were in a spaceship traveling towards the Earth, and you somehow could see it traveling this quick quickly, um, or maybe you're flying by the Earth, if you were going, uh, again, we did the math, if we were going 0.999999999991% the speed of light, the Earth would appear 50 feet thick. Uh, so I guess technically uh, the Earth is flat just from the right frame of reference. Um, so uh, yeah, now again, I could do an entire video about proof of why we know the Earth is round. And if you're interested in that, please uh, drop a comment in the comment section and I will consider that because we still have quite a few weeks uh, that we will be continuing these deep dive streams. Um, one other quick thing I wanted to touch on is that in the uh, the uh, Discworld novels, uh, magic is very prevalent, as I said, and there is actually a color to magic. It's called The Color of Magic. In fact, that is uh, the name of the first book, I believe. Um, and its name is Octarin, and it's uh, the eighth color, they say, and they kind of describe it as a fluorescent greenish yellow purple, which is very funny. Um, but I just wanted to kind of bring up the fact that there are a lot of colors that we can't see, and we've talked about this a little bit before. Um, the colors that the human eye sees are in the visible spectrum of light. And light is a wave, um, or we can describe it as a wave, and waves have wavelengths. So that's the length between uh, the waves, so to speak. Uh, and the wavelengths of light that we can see, let me move my head out of the way, are between 380 and 780 nanometers, which is pretty tiny. Um, but that's just visible light. Uh, electromagnetic radiation occurs in many wavelengths outside of that, and the human eye just can't see them. Um, so we could imagine these different colors as sort of, you know, the, an eighth color, the color of magic, so to speak. And um, these range it from, you know, infrared rays, ultraviolet X-rays, gamma rays, uh, radio waves as well um, are actually very, very long wavelengths. Uh, and uh, there are uh, different animals. I'm not going to dive too deeply into biology, but um, there are uh, different species of animals that are able to sense things like, like heat. Uh, and are able to perceive those other wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. Um, so in a way, I guess uh, there is, you know, sort of magical colors out there that humans just can't see. Um, oh, another funny thing about the Discworld novels is that light is very slow. It only travels a few hundred miles per hour uh, compared to the uh, 186,282 miles per second that light travels in our universe. And this is mostly due to Discworld's embarrassingly strong magnetic field. <laughs> Although uh, Terry Pratchett claims that the physical effects of this slow light are uh, negligible mostly due to the effects of a fictional element he describes as narrativium. So take that what you will. All right, so I want to move on to another favorite fictional universe, the universe of ice and fire in Game of Thrones. Now the continent of West Westeros exists on a fictional planet that uh, has a couple differences from our own. Uh, you know, there are dragons flying around. Uh, we usually don't have those. 
Um, but the one thing that makes it very weird, and the thing we're going to talk about in our stream today, is the seasons on Westworld or on Westeros. Um, uh, and Westeros, uh, or just the, the planet that a Game of Thrones takes place on, uh, has very interesting seasons. The seasons vary by years, so summer may last ten years, and winter could last even longer. But one interesting thing they talk about in Game of Thrones and the, the books A Song of Ice and Fire uh, is that these seasons are kind of unpredictable and they can vary in length. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about Earth's seasons and what gives us our seasons. Now, our seasons are caused mostly by our axial tilt, um, or uh, the scientific term is the obliquity of the Earth. So how tilted over it is. Um, and uh, on average, the axial tilt of the Earth is, Earth is 23.5 degrees. And this is what mostly causes our seasons and the, how we perceive them year to year these days. Um, so in the summertime in June, on the, the June solstice actually, um, the summer solstice, solstice, the North Pole will be pointing as directly towards the sun as it ever points. Uh, and that is summertime here in the Northern Hemisphere. In the winter, the winter solstice, December 21st, as we talked about, the North Pole is pointing away. Um, and then on the equinoxes, uh, the North Pole is sort of uh, going to be um, parallel, or the plane of the sort of the North Pole, if that makes sense. Uh, so um, and this is what uh, causes our seasons. Uh, so, so you can kind of think of it as uh, in the summertime, the North Pole is kind of leaning, or the Northern Hemisphere is leaning towards the sun, so it's warmer. In the winter, we're leaning away from the sun, so it's colder. Um, now, this is how seasons work on Earth. Um, and these go in yearly cycles, but there are actually other factors that affect uh, Earth's seasons. Um, for example, there is something called the eccentricity of Earth's orbit. Now, this is basically how oval-shaped the Earth's orbit is. Now, the Earth orbits around the Sun in generally a circle pattern, but this pattern is not a perfect circle. It is an oval, and this actually changes. Um, so, uh, Earth, this elliptical orbit changes uh, about once every 100,000 years. Um, so over the course of 100,000 years, the Earth's orbit will grow and become more elliptical and then shrink again. And this is cyclical. This will happen. So every 100,000 years, it kind of changes shape. Um, and then another thing I've talked about is precession. The Earth's uh, rotation processes. Um, so I've shown you that how a top will spin around. This is actually not going to work on here. A top will spin around very quickly, um, but it'll also do this slow wobble, and that's called precession. Uh, and the Earth has precession as well, and its wobble takes place about once every 25,000 years. That's why the North Star will not always be the North Star, and if you want to learn more about that, uh, be sure to tune into our um, our uh, uh, Monday streams where we take a tour of the night sky. Uh, but anyway, so this precession changes as well. And then lastly, the obliquity, the tilt of the Earth's axis, uh, does also change over time. About every 40,000 years, it will shift uh, between 22 degrees and about 24 and a half degrees. Uh, now, in uh, the early 1900s, there was a Serbian mathematician named uh, Mulitin uh, Milinkovic who calculated uh, and put these cycles together and graphed them out. And he basically discovered that these cycles actually corresponded with Earth's recent major ice ages. Uh, so, um, basically, whenever these three sort of wave patterns aligned perfectly um, to make the Earth as far away from the sun as possible, that is generally when the ice ages have occurred. So we could imagine a planet like a planet that what the planet that Westeros is on, um, maybe have maybe it has cycles like this, but maybe they're a lot stronger and more exaggerated. Maybe the eccentricity is much wider, and that combined with the obliquity, the tilt, uh, and the precession um, could actually cause seasons that are much um, quicker. But you would think that uh, the scientists or maesters in the the Game of Thrones universe would be able to calculate this and predict it. But in that universe, the uh, seasons are Kind of unpredictable. Um, well, uh, there is another theory uh, that, or another model that actually describes um, uh, how this system might be unpredictable. And if we go back over uh, to um, our universe sandbox, uh, they actually have a simulation built in here that simulates a potential planet that the lands of ice and fire could be on. There's actually a little description. This is actually based on an April Fool's Day uh, a paper that was released by some astronomers. Um, 
and I can bring that paper up and show you. Uh, now, it was released in April Fool's Day, but it is actually a, it has decent science to it and is correct in the theoretical model, but a lot of the writing is a little bit, uh, a little bit tongue in cheek, talking about different settings and characters from series. So this is pretty funny. Um, I can, uh, we can post a link uh, to this paper if you um, would like to check it out for yourself. Um, do uh, enter at your own risk because uh, the series of Ice and Fire does have uh, subject matter that uh, could be considered not for all ages. Um, I haven't read through the entire paper, but I'm assuming it's probably uh, fairly safe. Um, so they theorized a system of a planet orbiting a binary star system. And basically, uh, due to the chaotic nature of the interaction between these uh, rotating stars uh, orbiting each other and the planet going around them, we basically, uh, thanks to chaos theory, are not able to accurately predict uh, the changing, uh, change, uh, changing seasons in this system. So if I select uh, West, our fictional planet of Westeros here, we can actually see the temperature varying. Now this is the average surface temperature, um, so even if this doesn't seem like a lot of variation, um, we can imagine that average you know, being much, uh, the numbers leading to that average being much wider. Uh, so we can see that uh, the seasons are changing pretty unpredictably and kind of going from warm to cold uh, by, over the course of uh, many, many years, and similarly to how uh, the worlds of ice and fire uh, operate. Um, so, uh, yeah, so pretty interesting that this, uh, now, of course, in the series, they don't often talk about there being two stars in the sky. Um, maybe one of them is a black hole, who knows? Uh, but uh, just kind of a fun, fun little uh, experiment that some scientists figured out to try to calculate, you know, how could this system actually work? All right, before we move on, I'm going to check the comment section. Uh, let's see, we've got a question from David. Are the changes to Earth's elliptical orbit bringing us closer to the sun or further away? Where are we in this cycle now? Uh, that is a very good question. Oh, and it brings up something I didn't men men mean to mention earlier. Um, and I'm not entirely sure actually where we are in that cycle. Let's go back. Uh, so if we go back to our chart here, this is a chart um, that I believe was put together in the uh, 70s. So if we take that as sort of recent history, I guess. And again, this is in thousands of years, so we can consider that. So our zero line here is showing us uh, the the cycles. Um, so you were asking about the eccentric, excuse me, the eccentricity, uh, which is the elliptical orbit shape. Um, and it looks like we are fairly elliptical right now. So the higher the eccentricity, the more elliptical it is. Um, and zero is basically a circle. Uh, so you can see we are uh, sort of more than average elliptical, becoming more elliptical. Um, and if we go back in time, we can see uh, that, you know, about 30,000 years or so, it was nearly circular. Uh, and if we check our other cycles, this is the obliquity. Um, we are kind of right in the middle of that as well. So it looks like our tilt is going to be more pronounced over the next few thousand years, which will mean the seasons could become slightly more extreme. Uh, and then the, uh, this is the uh, precession, um, which is the, the wobble that I talked about there. Um, yeah, so, uh, but the thing I wanted to mention earlier is that uh, if you're wondering, scientists have compared these models with our current observations of climate change over the past few hundred years, and those models do not account for uh, the climate change that we are seeing in recent human history, which is why the majority, the vast majority of the scientific community agree that the climate change we are seeing right now is primarily caused by humans. All right, so um, again, just looking at the questions, I've got a question from uh, Kristen. Uh, I, saw, I see your comment about uh, 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 the topic for next Wednesday. So next Wednesday, our stream is actually going to be focused on the SpaceX launch, um, which is uh, uh, upcoming. This is the, uh, I mentioned this a couple times, and this is the first time Americans have sent American astronauts aboard an American spacecraft. Um, that will be happening on Wednesday next week. So we'll be covering the uh, Crew Dragon mission um, uh, but the following Wednesday, we have not announced our topic for that, so um, perhaps we will cover some of the topics mentioned today. Um, and then Kristen also asks, uh, will Ursa Major always point to the North's North Star? Um, and that's actually a really great question. Um, even though the precession will change and the North Star will change, if we're talking about Polaris, the actual star that right now is the North Star, um, Ursa Major will point there 
uh, for a long time. But the stars are actually moving. All the stars are orbiting a central point in our galaxy. Um, and they are moving. We call this motion proper motion, and they move very slowly, but over time, the shape of the constellations will change. Uh, and so they will not always point, uh, those two stars will not always point to the North Star because over time those stars will shift and that point, that sort of line will change positions. Um, so uh, Jennifer is asking if we know of any planets that orbit a binary star system. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to be bringing that up in just a minute, actually, for the next fictional universe. So thanks for asking that great question. That's leading us into something I've already planned to talk about. Um, but there's one other thing in the world of ice and fire I wanted to mention, because there is a, uh, a, um, a, uh, a comet that appears, I believe, in the second novel. Uh, that is a, sort of an omen that is a harbinger of things to come in the series. No spoilers. Uh, but the main property of this comet is that it is a red comet. And so I wanted to do a little research and figure out, could comets actually appear red or, or have any of them? Um, so if you don't know, comets are uh, objects that uh, often come from very, very far out in our solar system uh, in a region called the Oort Cloud, which is kind of a bubble of icy, uh, rocky objects like asteroids. Uh, but gravitational perturbations sometimes kick these objects in towards the center of our solar system. And as these objects get close to the sun, um, uh, the elements on their surface start boiling and uh, fuming away, uh, which gives them a coma. Uh, and then they end up having tails. One tail is the dust tail of debris flying away from the nucleus of the comet. And then one is an ion tail um, that is facing away from the sun as the sun is burning away uh, these materials on this comet. So that's what a comet is. Um, and there are some known comets that uh, are relatively periodic. Um, that come uh, every few years. There are some famous comets that come only every 70 or so years, like Halley's Comet. Um, what about red comets, though? Because most of the comets we see uh, appear very bluish in color, that ion tail and then the sort of yellow glow of the dust tail. Um, so short answer is that the red color probably would not be possible. Um, the strongest emissions that come from the coma of comets are in the blue and green spectra, and this is mostly due to the natural gases found in those uh, the coma of those comets, which is hydroxide and cyanide, and amongst other things. Um, but these emit uh, uh, electromagnetic waves, light waves, in mostly the blue spectrums. Um, as far as the dust tails, that's visible light reflecting off those tails, and that light is coming from the sun. And our star, at least, is a yellow star, so that light is usually whitish yellow. And I believe the star in the Game of Thrones universe is also yellow as well. Um, and there is one type of emission uh, that is closer to red, uh, and it is called forbidden oxygen, which is kind of funny. Didn't have time to do deep research into that, but I just love that there's uh, a process that could happen on a comet that is called forbidden oxygen, which sounds very weird. Um, this energy transition is very faint and short-lived, though, so it would be very unlikely to be seen, especially with, the vis with just the naked eye and the visible spectrum. So red comets, at least in our universe, are generally not possible. All right, so uh, of course, I, <laughs> we are coming, uh, cutting close here on time, but um, it seems like everybody's having a good time so far, so we're just going to keep plugging along. Um, and uh, let me check real quick our questions. Uh, David's asking, uh, or is saying, the unpredictability of a two to three star system is the premise behind the most popular science fiction series in China. Ah, the three body problem. Yeah, that that is sitting on my bookshelf. Uh, and. Uh, I have been uh, meaning to read it. So, you know, thanks for that uh, that uh, extra push because it, it has been recommended to me so many times, but uh, that is interesting to know that it's about the two or three star, star system. So um, I will definitely be checking that out. Uh, it has been on my list for a while. Let's jump into one of everybody's favorite fictional universes, a universe of science fiction and a bit of fantasy, Star Wars. Star Wars uh, is... Uh, a fan favorite universe involving um, a lot of science fiction elements. Uh, you have spaceships and uh, space battles and distant planets and aliens. Uh, there's a bit of fantasy with things like the Force and lightsabers, which definitely uh, probably could not exist. Um, but uh, there is some science we can talk about. Uh, and uh, I wanted to uh, first start by showing you uh, a small moon. We're going to go over to Space Engine here, which is a simulation of our universe. So we are going to find a small moon named Mimas. And that's no moon. That Oh, actually, it is a moon. Sorry. <laughs> that was my Death Star joke. Although, 
This moon is famous for looking very strikingly similar to the Death Star. This moon has a very large crater, which is kind of hard to see right now because of the way the shadows are crossing this moon. But if I fast forward time and let this moon rotate a little bit, you can see there's an extremely large crater on this moon that uh, kind of looks like the star destroying laser on the Death Star. Um, so this is just kind of a fan favorite uh, stop in astronomy uh, because that does appear as the Death Star. But let's talk about the science of the Death Star, Death, the, excuse me, the Death Star a little bit because uh, that Death Star is pretty powerful. Powerful enough that in the first Star Wars film, uh, it destroyed an entire planet. And I just realized, I hope we don't get a copyright strike for showing this clip. Sorry, Ben, if we do. <laughs> um, we won't show more than 30 seconds of it. Hopefully that, that will still count. Um, so <laughs> the Death Star uh, in, uh, is able to destroy a planet. Well. It would take a lot of energy to destroy a planet, a lot of force, no pun intended. Um, and of course, scientists have calculated the amount of force that it would take to actually uh, destroy an entire planet. Uh, and that is roughly 2.24 times 10 to the 32nd power joules, um, which is roughly about one full week's worth of work uh, that the sun uh, puts out energy. So uh, if you could capture the energy of the sun for one entire week and store that somehow, that is about the amount of energy uh, that it would take to destroy a planet like Earth. And we're assuming Alderaan is about the size of Earth. Um, that's a lot of energy. Uh, and it's kind of funny because in The Force Awakens, uh, one of the recent Star Wars movies, uh, there is a much larger planet-sized weapon called Star Killer Base that um, actually did siphon energy from a star. So in that way, they kind of got the science a little bit more correct in that movie than they did in the original Star Wars. Go figure. Um, but anyway, it would take a lot of energy to destroy a planet. Um, and the other thing is that thanks to Newton's third law of motion, which is that every action has an opposite and e equal reaction, um, if they shot that laser at that planet, releasing all the energy in one direction would cause the Death Star to accelerate in the opposite direction, which it clearly does not in that clip. Um, so there are some ways around this, though. Perhaps the Death Star actually was firing antimatter at Alderaan. And this would only require half the energy, since the planet itself would supply the other half of the energy. Uh, and uh, the amount of antimatter to equal that energy would be about 2.7 quadrillion pounds, um, which is uh, very large. About the size of, uh, about halfway between uh, the moons of Mars. So if we go over to um, Mars, Mars has two moons that are small rocky bodies. Scientists think they were likely captured asteroids. Um, but here is Phobos. Uh, and the other one is Deimos, which I still don't know how to spell. There we go. Um, so if we were able to fire a rock about this size at the speed of light at the planet, uh, then uh, it could destroy a planet. Um, so uh, a little bit of science behind there. Uh, but again, there are some other questions I would have about the Star Wars uh, universe. <laughs> um, now, the other thing I wanted to mention, which is going to touch back on uh, the question uh, that Jennifer asked earlier, um, is about uh, binary systems and the setting of the Star Wars films. At least uh, they start out on the planet Tatooine, which has a very, very famous scene, um, which I wish I had a picture of. But it's Luke looking out over a sunset with two stars. Um, and those binary systems, the, I showed you a fictional one that could show us the Game of Thrones world. but uh, are there planets orbiting binary star systems? There are binary star systems out there. There are many that you can see in the night sky, actually. Um, and we have found an Earth-like planet orbiting uh, a binary star system. And this uh, planet is around the system Kepler-453, um, which Space Engine luckily has. And we're going to go to 453b, which is the particular planet that is going to remind us a lot of... Uh, Tatooine. Uh, this planet appears to have a dusty ring system as well, um, but if we zoom out here, we can see that this planet is orbiting two suns. So if we fly down here towards this planet, and maybe we find a spot close to the sunset over here, we can fly in 
and actually land on the surface of this planet and maybe get ourselves a nice little Star Wars sunset. So if you look out over here, this is of course a simulation of this planet. Um, you might uh, be able to see a site like this if you're on this planet. Um, so uh, it is pretty cool. This was uh, discovered by the Kepler Space Telescope, which we've talked about in our, uh, I believe, our space probes uh, video. Um, or I talked about it, uh, I think it was actually the stream about the Voyager probes because somebody asked a question about probe failures, and Kepler has an interesting story with uh, how it initially failed, um, but uh, then uh, they actually were able to figure out how to reactivate it in a very creative way. Um, but uh, the telescope did discover um, this planet uh, orbiting uh, this binary star system. Uh, so pretty cool. Um, uh, oh, this is actually a different, uh, sorry, this is a different planet. Uh, this is a gas giant planet found orbiting a star system, but Kepler also discovered this one as well. Um, so yeah, so there are planets like uh, the uh, settings in Star Wars and perhaps uh, this particular planet um, which uh, we may be able to go to someday. Um, it's only 1,600 light years away, you know, pretty close to Earth, uh, relatively speaking, I suppose. So perhaps someday we'll visit this Tatooine and maybe we'll find uh, Luke's lightsaber there. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> that's really not a spoiler. Uh, all right. So... Guys, I've got a ton of other stuff I could talk about, but we are approaching the end of the stream, and I think I may want to just save this for another one because it seems like y'all are enjoying this particular topic, um, and I have uh, information about how astronomy works in the Harry Potter universe. We could talk about the interstellar movie uh, with black holes and the possibility of traveling through one. And there are other universes like A Wrinkle in Time or Star Trek or the Marvel Universe that have a lot of science and astronomy we could talk about as well. Um, so I think I'm just going to call it right now. We are going to put a pin in this topic and we will continue um, in a couple weeks uh, with uh, a, another live stream talking about universes of fiction. Um, we will tentatively set that for uh, June 3rd, but we'll keep you posted, of course, if uh, the Dragon 2 launch is postponed for any reason. We may adjust our schedule a little bit. Um, but uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, but this does seem like a good stopping point. While we're wrapping up, though, if you have any other questions, um, please put them in the comments. And I just wanted to mention that uh, we did a, get a question from Brian asking uh, when the planetarium will open back up. Uh, and uh, we have a link in the comments that has information about Union Station's reopening plan. So I'd encourage you to check that out and learn about our plan for slowly and safely reopening the Science Center, the planetarium, and Union Station. Uh, I, for one, can't wait to see you under the stars of the planetarium. But in the meantime, I want to thank you all so much again for tuning in to our evening live streams. We're going to continue doing these on Mondays and Wednesdays for the time being. Uh, and we're going to look to continue these in some capacity even after we reopen. So don't worry, there will be opportunities for us to talk space and science uh, in the future. And I will keep you posted on the next uh, Wednesday topic, uh, whether that will be, uh, or we're going to plan on continuing our worlds of fiction topic uh, in two weeks, uh, assuming next week's launch goes according to plan. Um, but we'll keep you posted about that. So be sure to stay tuned. We're going to be posting a lot of information on the Planetarium's Facebook page um, about the upcoming launch. Uh, so be sure to, if you haven't already, uh, if you haven't already, like and subscribe to the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium, um, and you can learn all about that launch. The launch itself will be taking place uh, earlier in the day on that Wednesday, next Wednesday. It'll be uh, happening starting about 3 p.m. We're going to be posting a link to. Uh, a live stream where you can watch that live and learn all about the launch and then of course at 6 p.m next wednesday you'll find me right back here uh where we will be talking about that launch and we'll check out some clips hopefully and talk about how it went and uh we'll talk about spacex and sort of their history and the history behind uh, the commercial uh space flight industry um so i'm not seeing any other questions uh, so we are going to go ahead and wrap up this live stream. Thank you all again so much uh, for joining me. Uh, and thank you so much again for supporting Union Station. Uh, please tell your friends about these streams. If you'd like to learn more about how you can support Union Station, feel free to, uh, there's a donut, 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 <laughs> donate link on uh, the stream pages. And you can go to unionstation.org for more information there, or just renewing your membership would be a great option too. 
Um, there are member perk benefits that will uh, actually be already starting as soon as we open, so be sure to check that out. Um, but for the time being, uh, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. I've been Patrick Hess, your Planetarium Specialist. Thanks so much for joining us for another live stream. I'll see you next Monday at 6, next Monday at 6 p.m. Uh, for our What's Up stream for the week. I'll take a tour of the night sky. For now, we all have a wonderful rest of your week and a wonderful weekend. Uh, and I will be seeing you then. This is Patrick S. signing off. See y'all later.